You know, I like collecting amazing facts, and uh, one of the amazing facts we shared recently on our radio program was regarding the Queen Mary. It's that great ship that was built during the 1930s. When it was built, it was bigger than the Titanic in every way. It was the biggest ship in the world. Made several trips, I think uh, several's not right, a thousand trips across the Atlantic. It uh, became famous during World War II. Not only was it a cruise liner that sailed the seven seas, in addition to a thousand trips across the Atlantic, but it saved many, many lives during the um, World War II, transporting thousands of soldiers and wounded and prisoners of war, even transported Winston Churchill into New York Harbor. But then in the uh, 70s, it was sold by Cunard Lines. They made a resort, a hotel, a museum, a place where you could have parties and weddings out of the ship, but it never leaves port. It's got lifeboats, lifeboats on a ship. Now, you know, one extreme is having the Titanic, not enough lifeboats. The opposite extreme is to have a ship that never leaves ports with lifeboats. You can't even lower them. They'd hit the ground. has an engine, has a bridge, it has all of the features that would make it a great ship, but it's really a misnomer. It never goes anywhere. Something like some churches that are filled with activity and we've got all of the furnishings and advertise that we're a ship, but if we're not transporting people, if we're not adventuring, if we're not going forward, then we're not doing the obvious, are we? You know, it's possible, indeed it's a danger that is very real, that churches can exist and become so preoccupied with our own internal workings that we become oblivious to the obvious. Now we're here this Sabbath morning and I'm so glad to see you, but it's possible that we may have forgotten why we're here. There are two great purposes for our existence to accept the gospel and to proclaim the gospel. This morning, I would like to review for you what is the gospel? What is the good news? Now, for two reasons. If you say, well, Pastor Doug, I already know and I have accepted the gospel, great. I would like to review for you because maybe you're not sharing the gospel. And I want you to understand it so you can share the gospel. There may be people who are here today who have been coming to church for years, but we've neglected the obvious. We have not accepted the gospel. And so, I hope there's something here for everybody. What is the gospel? Now, as we evaluate the definition for the gospel, the word gospel means good news. It's a Greek word, and it simply means, no matter how you translate it, good news, happy news, glad tidings would be possibly another translation. The information we have to understand the gospel comes from the Bible. The Bible must be our source book in presenting the gospel. If you use another bottom line resource to present and understand the gospel, you can pollute it. It must, in essence, come from the Bible. The Bible itself says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, here it is, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I like the way the King James translate, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible teaches us a few basic things dealing with a big problem and the answer. Everything in the Bible is always revolving around two big issues, sin and salvation. We've got a problem. It's a big problem. The problem is sin. How many have the problem? Everybody. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. Everybody has this problem and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is falling short of God's glory. Psalms 14 verse 3, there is none who does good. No, not one. Everybody has this problem with sin. 
Now it's probably appropriate for us to spend a moment defining what is sin. Let's understand the problem a little better. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Now we all know the most common definition. Sin is the transgression of the law. That would be as very basic. The law of love. Loving your neighbor and loving God. If we're not doing that, it's sin. Can I summarize sin for you in one word? Selfishness. Follow me. God is love. When man fell, he lost this natural motive of love and it was replaced by selfishness. As soon as we have selfish hearts, you are automatically sinful. All sin is selfishness. Whoever commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And then, of course, it would be, at the very least, the breaking of God's Ten Commandments. It's a sin to lie, to kill, to steal, to commit adultery, to worship other gods, and so forth. Another definition, Romans 14, verse 23. Whatever is not from faith is sin. If our conscience convicts us and we believe we're doing the wrong thing, if we're not acting based on faith, it's sin. Sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. 1 John chapter 5, verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin. Sin is any action or attitude that falls short of God's perfect standard. Now, there are two kinds of sin, principally. You've got sins where you can do something wrong. It's called sins of commission. It means you commit a sin, like committing a crime. That means if you steal or you rob or you lie or you, uh, you know, do any of these things that are a violation of the Ten Commandments, you've committed a sin. That's one aspect. Another aspect of sin is sins of neglect or omission. When there's something good we should do, and we neglect it. God places somebody in our path who is in desperate need and we have the ability to help that need and we neglect them. We pass by the man who has fallen among thieves. We didn't beat him up. We didn't rob him. We just passed by. That's called a sin of omission. We are all guilty of sin. You know, when Jesus talks about the judgment, he especially condemns those who are guilty of the sins of omission more than the sins of commission. You notice he does not say to the goats, depart from me, you wicked, into everlasting fire because you lied and you stole and you committed adultery and you broke the Sabbath. He says, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire because I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty, you did not give me drink. I was a stranger, you did not come to me or visit me in the hospital. He's talking about sins of omission there. So never think to yourself that sins of omission, well, that's minor, but committing sins, that's major. The Lord tells us that they're both equally deadly. And something else that we need to recognize, this problem of sin, falling short of God's glory, we not only all have it, it's something we have from the very beginning. We are all born with it. That's right. <laughs> Psalm 51, verse 5. Now you think little baby isn't a sinner, but they're really the most selfish creatures in the world, aren't they? I mean, that doesn't mean they have a record of breaking this commandments of God, but it's intrinsic in our natures. The Bible says, Behold, I was brought forth, Psalm 51, verse 5, I was brought forth in iniquity, in sin my mother did conceive me. Job puts it this way, Yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. And keep in mind, I'm just giving you a few samples of hundreds of scriptures I could give you on these basics in the Bible. This teaching is all through the Bible. We are born sinful. We are born with these selfish natures. And while it is true that there's only one individual who did not sin, and that's Jesus, every other person who has been born or will be born will sin given time. If they live to the age of accountability, they will sin. And it's just because it's in our nature. Which brings us to another sobering truth. The Bible teaches sin is terminal. It's deadly. It's a disease that will kill. The Bible tells us the wages for sin is death. Again, Ezekiel 18, verse 4, the soul who sins shall die. This is a complete sentence. It tells who does what, and the consequences are death. Since we've all sinned, and we seem like we cannot avoid it because we're born with this selfish nature, yet we're living under a death penalty. That's pretty serious. So what we're talking about today, you might say, 
It's as important as life and death. Understanding the gospel is a life and death issue. Would you say that's an exaggeration? Or is that a fact? It's a simple fact. That understanding and accepting the gospel is a life and death issue. That means there's really nothing more important than that. If you want to underscore and highlight that something is important, you would say, this is a life and death issue. People sometimes use that in a flippant way, and it's not really true. They make a phone call or dial 911 when they've got a flat tire. And then they get chastised by the operator. They say, don't use this number unless it's important. Well, friends... We have a big problem. Sin is deadly. We have all sinned. The penalty is death. This is a life and death issue. Sin is a terminal disease. There are varying forms of cancer. And I always like to approach this delicately because it's one of the top two or three killers in North America. And there are people watching or here who are struggling with this. There are different kinds of cancer, and certain types of cancer are more deadly. Some you have a higher probability of healing. Some cancers, well, as soon as you hear a person say, they've got cancer of this or that, the face blanches and you say, oh, that's a death sentence, isn't it? Some types of cancer, very high probability of recovery. Well, when you say sin, you're talking about the most malignant, deadly form of cancer. It is terminal. But there's good news coming. Now, in order for you to appreciate the good news, you've got to know the bad news. Did you know that? The good news is a whole lot gooder when you understand how bad the bad news is. So forgive me if I'm accentuating how bad the bad news is, but you'll then really appreciate the good news. Sin, one of the worst things, it separates us. Now, sin separates in three ways. Sin separates you from God. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, the Bible says, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and you cannot look on wickedness. If we are sinners, God cannot look on wickedness. It separates us from Him. The Bible tells us, Isaiah 59, verse 2, this is very plain. Your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have caused Him to hide His face from you so He will not hear. Our sins separate us from God. So there's three ways that sin separates. Sin separates you from your Creator. Ultimately, if we are not saved from our sins, it will eternally separate us from God. And that is the most horrible thing if you really understand it. The highest joy is to be in the presence of God. One of the greatest promises in the Bible that people often miss is where God says, God Himself will be with them. When Jesus ascended to heaven, He said, I will be with you. This is what love's all about. You want to be with the one you love. To be forever separated from your Creator and the source of all good and light is, is a terrible thing. Sin separates. Sin separates you from God. You know one reason we cannot see God now? Because sin has separated us. Are there creatures on other planets? I believe that God has made other creatures besides our world. And we know He has angels and cherubim and seraphim. The Bible says that God through Christ made the worlds, plural. Why can't we see them? And I don't believe all these stories about UFOs and captured by aliens. This planet has been quarantined from the rest of the universe because of sin. We've been separated. Sin separates you from others. You know, whenever I get involved in any kind of marriage counseling, you can always sum it up in one word what the problem is. Sin. And I've told you what that is. Selfishness. In almost 99.99% of the cases where there is conflict in a marriage or family, selfishness. It's sin. Sin separates us from each other. You got that? In so many cases where there is sin separates friends. Separates in families, separates work associates. Sin will separate you from you. Now what I mean by that is, you've heard about people who've got low self-esteem. Some of the most ornery people in the world are people who just don't like themselves. And their sin has created an internal revulsion for themselves. 
You ever heard a person described as detached? Sin separates you from you. Some people are not in connection with reality. Sin separates. It's one of the, the awful consequences of sin. Now after we've understood something about the enormity of this problem, we all have this problem. It's a terminal problem. It's a painful problem. All of the disease and the suffering and the thorns and the thistle and the, the filth and the stench of the world it can be summed up in one word, sin. Sin is the problem. You can't point to anything bad without me making a connection between that bad thing and sin. The Bible says God is good. Well, then it should be evident sin is bad. We are helpless to change our situation. We have absolutely no strength to overcome this problem of sin. Job 14 verse 4, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Can we make ourselves clean? Jeremiah 13 23, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Spurgeon said, men and women trifle with forbidden things until they have neither heart nor strength to rise to their heavenly calling. And the longer we trifle with sin, the more helpless we become. It's like Paul said, that which I would not do, that I do. And that which I would do, I do not. We get to this condition of hopeless and helplessness. We can't do anything to save ourselves. And the sooner we recognize that, the more eligible we are for the solution. Whenever we think that we have the power to save ourselves, you know what your strongest appeal is when you pray to God? Your utter helplessness. You know what prayers I think are the most eloquent in the ears of God? Not the ones where people ask God for a little help. Say, I can do it, just need a little push, a little head start, jump start me. It's the ones where they pray their utter helplessness. And then God, can, He can work because He recognizes it. Look at all the times in the Bible where the situation looked hopeless and that's when God does His best work. The most hopeless situation, people like Mary Magdalene or a demoniac that is stark, raving, mad, chained, lunatic, living with decomposing bones. That's when the Lord does His greatest work among those who recognize their helplessness, their hopelessness. The scribes and Pharisees thought that God was helping them a little bit. He couldn't do anything for them. So we recognize our helpless condition. Now we get to the best part. We've talked about the problem. What is the answer for the problem? Once you understand how desperate our problem is, that we are under this death decree, then we can start to appreciate what the gospel is, the good news. Good news is especially good news once we understand the darkness of the bad news. The good news is, you say it with me, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that's good news when you consider there are two alternatives, perish or everlasting life. That's what makes the good news so good. That's what makes the gospel good news, is that we are going to perish without Jesus. But God loves us so much that He gave His Son that we don't need to perish. God became a man, and He came to earth. Now turn with me to better understand a summary of the gospel. One of the most powerful, clear passages in the Bible. There's many, but one that is very concise is Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verse 16. Jesus begins His ministry. And He summarizes His ministry Himself at the beginning. He does it in the church on Sabbath, no less, reading from the Bible. You cannot improve on the context in which He explains the Gospel. So He came to Nazareth. This is Luke 4, verse 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. I'm very thankful the scriptures are clear that Jesus had a pattern of going to church on the Sabbath and he read his Bible. It's a custom for him. 
It's good for you to be here today. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. They did not have the benefit of having all the books of the Bible in one volume. They had scrolls and, and because, you know, they didn't have all the printing process we have today. And they pulled off the book of Isaiah and he took it and here's what he read. He was handed the, verse 17, he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah and when he opened the book he found the place. They didn't tell him today, here is your scripture reading. You know, when we have church here, I tell the young people, this is my sermon and here's the scripture reading I want you to read. They did not tell him what to read. He found the place. That means it was a very deliberate verse that he chose. Here's what he chose. It's from Isaiah chapter 61, principally verse 2, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. Now, what does the word Messiah or Christ mean? Messiah is the Hebrew word for anointed. Christ is the Greek for word, Christos, the anointed. Jesus begins in His hometown. You know, whenever a presidential candidate gets ready to launch his campaign, he usually goes back to his hometown, right? And he makes the announcement there. He identifies with his roots. So here he goes to his hometown and he stands up in his hometown church. And he says, I'm letting you know today, I am the Messiah and the Holy Spirit is upon me. That's a pretty bold claim. And what is his mission? What was the purpose of the Messiah? He gives it to us. God came to earth in the form of a man. God so loved the world, he sent his son. Here's why. To preach the gospel to the poor. To give the good news to what kind of poor? Just people who have a low income or who are in debt? Well, we know that they're the ones who are the most receptive to the teaching of Christ. But blessed are the poor in spirit. He's anointed me to give the good news to the poor. He sent me to heal. Just heal bodies? He doesn't stop there and say heal bodies. To heal the brokenhearted. There's something wrong with our hearts. Our hearts are broken. And I'm not talking about lovesick romantic problems. I'm talking about hearts that are broken. You know, when the Lord first made us, He designed our hearts, our minds, to be craving God. Our hearts were designed with a key, and the only key that fits that hole is Jesus. Now, I will suggest to you a theory, and the more I think about it, the more convinced I am that it's true. I'm on the verge of stating it as fact. God created all humans addicts. I know that's such an ugly word. You say, Doug, how could you say that? Well, it's okay to be addicted to something good. He designed us to be addicted to Him. If you study what an addiction is, it is a behavior, a substance, that controls a person. The alcoholic is thinking through the day where their next drink is coming from. The foodaholic is planning where they hide their candy bars and when they're going to go retrieve them. The shopaholic is looking at and clipping the coupons, looking at all the sale catalogs, right? The workaholic is constantly thinking about the next task or project. Uh, the, whatever your addiction is, it controls your thinking and be, your behavior. And it, 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 your life is guided by this addiction. If we are addicted to God, that would be okay. To be preoccupied with God. God designed our hearts to be filled with this need for Him. When we do not have God in our hearts, we are broken hearted. Because we will then try to fill that vacuum with some other God. And it may be drugs or alcohol, it could be sex, it could be some sick codependent relationship, it could be food, it could be money, it could be work, and I've only touched the surface. And everybody here, if you're broken hearted, you just need to ask, what is your addiction? So when he came, he came to heal our broken hearts, but he's not done. He sent me to heal the broken hearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. We are bound, we are holden with the cords of our sins. We're held captive by the devil at his whim. He is called the fowler who snares the birds and we're caught in his pit that he dug for us. It goes on to say, 
recovery of sight to the blind. You know, one of the biggest problems in the world and that we need saving from is the world is in darkness. You know, one of the most beautiful things about the gospel is it gives you understanding. Maybe for me, more than some of you who are raised in Christian homes, but I don't know if you can appreciate the abject confusion that is in the world among those who do not have the God perspective. They don't know where they came from, they don't know what they're doing here, and they don't know where they're going. You cannot be happy without a few basics, and those basics are you need to know something about where you came from, what you're doing here, and where you're going. You don't have vision, you're blind, and so much of the world they are blind being led by the blind. Jesus came to open our eyes, to help us understand what the purpose of life is, to give us spiritual discernment and understanding, to recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are downtrodden. You know, so many cases in life where people are being oppressed by others. They're not only trapped. The Bible talks about he came to set the captives free. That's the story of the Exodus, isn't it? The story of the Exodus is setting the captives free. Daniel going from the status of being a captive to prime minister. Joseph going from the prison to the palace. Many stories in the Bible about how God liberates us. He came to set the captives free, but it's more than that. Those that are oppressed. It's one thing when you're in prison, but it's something else when you are being toyed with and oppressed. It's what they did to Samson. They took this blind man and they made sport of him. It's tormenting somebody who is captive. That's the oppression. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The message of the gospel is the gospel, the story that we can be accepted by God. That's good news. Because sin separates us from God. The gospel is that Jesus came to help us find acceptance with God. And after he says that, he stops. Actually, he didn't even finish the sentence where he talked about judgment. He deliberately stopped because this was the purpose of his first coming, to proclaim the gospel. And then he closed the book, he gave it to the attendant, and he sat down, and all the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And then he said to them, Today is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. In other words, this is why I came, this is who I am, and this is what I'm going to do. That's a very important verse. He summarized the purpose of the gospel in that one reading and he did it by using scripture. The Bible must be our authority for understanding that. Acts 10.38 How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He is the anointed. Who went about doing good. You know what that means? Everything he did was good. But he didn't just do it when he ran into it. He went about doing good. He went and did good even if it was out of his way. People would say, just speak the word. Uh, you don't have to come and he'd go. You don't have to touch them. They've got leprosy. They're blind. They're dirty. He would put his hands on the leper. He would touch the eyes of the blind. He went about doing good. He became involved in people's houses. He went to see the little girl who had died at the request of the father. Doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. You know, I especially like this verse because... It doesn't just talk about his healing physical sickness. He's talking about healing those who are oppressed by the devil. There are two forces that are battling in this world. The devil wants to destroy us and God wants to save us. The good news, the gospel, is how God can save us. There are three main reasons Jesus came. One is he came to show us the Father. The world has a distorted view of God. They think of him as a big policeman in the sky who is waiting for us to do something wrong so he can put us under his thumb and thump us with his heavenly billy club. He is abusing his infinite power to manipulate these weak creatures. God deliberately made us sinful so that he can then punish us when we do something wrong. Have you ever wondered before, you know, I'm born with this natural propensity for sin. How can God punish me for doing this? He must be mean. And then, of course, there are those who buy into this concept that God is a sadist who takes pleasure in the eternal torment of his creatures. So Jesus came to set the record straight about what the Father is like. Christ said to the disciples, He who has seen me, John 14, verse 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus came to show us the Father. And you know, the picture of the Father was radically changed forever by the first advent of Christ. 
I think even some of the Old Testament prophets would have been amazed at the compassion and the love and the tenderness and the patience of God that was reflected in God the Son. You know, I hear a story one time about during World War II, a lot of families were separated. Uh, men went off to fight at battle, and, and sometimes the homes in London were bombed during the Blitzkrieg to smithereens, and orphanages were filled with children who had either lost their parents or lost track of their parents. Dad could be off fighting in the war. In this one family, their home was bombed and the mother was killed while the father was fighting in the war. They had like seven or eight children, big family. They were all placed in an orphanage. Several of them were separated during the end of the war. As far as the children knew, their father was gone and they spent months in the orphanage. No one wanted to adopt them because the children wanted to stay together. All these siblings didn't want to be separated and no one could afford to adopt such a big group. But eventually the oldest brother was old enough to go out on his own and he said he would see what he could learn of father. And after spending a few weeks of making the connections of anyone in the family where they might have known what happened to father after the war, he finally was able to contact the father. And he couldn't wait to come back and tell his siblings that dad was alive and well. And when he came back and he met his younger brothers and sisters, he said, I've got good news for you. Dad survived the war. He's alive. And they hadn't seen him in years. And they'd forgotten. You know, the war lasted for uh, six, seven years in England. And they said, what's he like? Oh, he's good. What does he look like? And the oldest brother smiled and they said, well, everybody tells me that I'm his spitting image. He looks like me. I'm a chip off the old block. And if people want to know what the Father is like, look at Jesus. Jesus is a perfect reflection of the Father, the character of the Father. And some people think that, you know, God can't have any angry side. There could never be any wrath. But, you know, even Jesus, it talks about the wrath of the Lamb, too. He is a perfect representation of the Father. So I told you there's three reasons Jesus came. One, to show us the Father. Two, He came as our example. The Bible tells us He invites us to walk as He walked. He invites us to follow Him and become like Him. The Bible says in 1 John 2 verse 16, He who abides in Him ought Himself to walk just as He walked. Peter says He has given us an example that we should walk as He walked. Christ came to show us how to treat each other. He came for us to look at Him and then model our lives after Him, both by his example in his ministry. He gave us an example on how to minister. He said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. I've come to show you how to treat each other, how to love, how to forgive. In almost every situation, Jesus said, I'm not only showing you what the Father's like, I'm showing you how I want you to be. A Christian is a follower of Christ. So Jesus came as our example. And then I want to spend more time on the most important aspect of his mission. Jesus came as our substitute. He came to take our place. The penalty for sin is death. He came to take the death penalty for us. That's good news that someone would take something like that from us. Let me give you some scripture. Isaiah 53 verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. It's a universal problem. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. He died for your sins. Whether you believe it or not, whether you can understand it or not, it does not detract from the truth of the fact that he died for the sins of all the world and he died for all of your sins. And that's good news. He came to be your substitute. 1 John 4, 9, I'm sorry, 4, 10. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and He sent His Son to be the appropriation for our sins. Jesus came to pay the penalty for our sins. Now what is the penalty for sin? People say death, but it's more than that. The penalty for sin is suffering and death. Did Jesus just flip a switch and die on the cross or did He suffer and die. And when the Bible says the wicked are going to pay for their sins, do they just die? Or is each man punished according to what he deserves? And then he dies. Jesus took the entire penalty. He suffered and he died for your sins. 
You and I can't imagine that. Imagine all the suffering of the world, all the suffering of all the sins of the world being placed on one person. And the only reason he could do that is because he suffered as only God could suffer. First, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin, that's something else, don't miss this, Jesus was sinless so he could take our sins, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He traded places with us. Something like the story of the prodigal, I'm sorry, of the uh, Good Samaritan. It's like the story of the Good Samaritan where the Bible tells us that he said, you ride on my donkey, I will walk. We're going to trade places. He took our badness, he gives us his goodness. He took our weakness, he gives us his strength. He took our filth, he gives us his purity. He took everything bad that sin has done to us and he offers us everything good that he possessed. He made an incredible change with you and me. You know, Mark Twain, why he was a, a humorist and a little bit sarcastic, he took one of the principles of the Bible and he put it into a story called The Prince and the Pauper, where there were two people that looked very similar, two young men. One was a prince on the throne and one was a poor pauper. And they ran into each other through some uh, strange circumstances and they decided to experience one another's lives and they traded places. Many stories have played upon this truth that Jesus trades places with us. You know, the Bible tells us that Pontius Pilate held before the people two people when Christ was being tried, Barabbas and Jesus. There were three crosses already prepared that day for Barabbas and two thieves. They called for Barabbas. Barabbas deserved to die. He was a murderer, a thief, and a rebel. And the people said, give us him. Now think about this. You're Barabbas. You're rotten. You don't hear anything good about Barabbas in the Bible. All you hear is bad. He represents you and me. Jesus died on Barabbas' cross. Can you imagine being Barabbas and, and having the Roman soldiers come over and cut your ropes and saying you're free and you're almost afraid to ask, but you say, I don't understand. And then they point to the most pure individual who's ever lived and he's being flogged. He's being whipped by Roman soldiers and they say, he's going to die on your cross, he's taking your place. This is what happened. I heard a story, I've been to prisons in the Philippines and they're not quite like the prisons here. You actually walk in and you can go in with a family and they, act, they live and cook their own food on fires and I was in this prison with 10,000 men, some of them on death row and I was able to preach to them there. Well I heard a story a brother came into the prison to visit his twin brother. Evidently, the one in prison had inadvertently in an argument killed someone and he was convicted to um, death penalty. Now, they like here, they've got an appeal process where it takes a while before they execute. The thing is that the twin brothers, the one who was guilty of murder, had a family with several children that depended on him. His twin brother loved him so much that when he went to visit him in prison, because they were identical twins, they exchanged badges and clothes, and when the time came for the visitors to leave, he showed his brother's visitor badge. The ID on the registration was identical, and the guilty man went free, and his brother stayed in prison and took his death sentence for his brother. That's love, to trade places like that. This is what Jesus is offering to do for you. That's good news. It's sobering. It breaks your heart and it's supposed to. He died for you. That's another point. He came to take our penalty to trade places, but that involves dying, suffering and dying. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He doesn't die for us because we become good first. While we're bad, just as we are, even while we're enemies of his, he died for us. Did Barabbas like Jesus? Did he know Jesus? Did he accept Jesus? Before he had done any of those things, Jesus dies for him. Now you would hope that he changes his life after that. But before you ever even knew him, he loved you so much he died for you. First Peter 2.24 Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sin, might live for righteousness. Now that brings up a very important point. How does Jesus save us by his death? 
Well, it comes in three common terms. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. When we accept Jesus, we are justified. We come to him just like we are. That's what it means. God then looks at us just as if, justify, just as if we had never sinned. You come just like you are. You don't say, well, I'm going to start going to church and I'm going to start doing these things and then maybe God will forgive me. He will forgive you the first time you come just like you are. The prodigal son came to his father and he was embraced just as he was. Then sanctification is, he says, now follow me and learn to walk as I walk. I have also come as your example. He then gives us power to do new things and to live a new life. Glorification is when we receive the ultimate reward and we enter glory. Those are the three phases. So more of the good news of the gospel is that Jesus not only died for our sins, he paid the complete penalty. He died the death that would be experienced by the sinner. He faced the second death. He obviously didn't die the second death in that he rose. In the second death there is no resurrection from that. But he experienced the separation that the lost experience. And that's what tore from his heart the cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the good news is he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead as an illustration of what can happen for you and me. If we should die, we can rise. And he rose with a glorified body. And we can have a glorified body even like his body. 1 Corinthians 5, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He died for my sins. Why don't you say that? He died for my sins. Oh, that wasn't very good participation. He died for my sins. You just need to hear yourself say that. According to the Scriptures, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He ascended. He didn't stay dead. The Bible tells us that the good news is he not only rose, meaning we can rise, he is on the right hand of the Father interceding in our behalf. We've got an inside friend with the Almighty. For Christ has not entered holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God for us. He is before the Almighty for us. I don't have to go through the priest. I don't have to go through Mary. I can go directly to the Father through Christ. That's good news. That's what the gospel is. That we have an advocate with the Father. The Bible tells us, let me summarize the gospel for you. If you're tired, Jesus is our rest. He says, come unto me and I will give you the rest. Every Sabbath day we remember the rest that we find all through the week in Jesus and we celebrate it physically as well. The way the weary dove went to the ark and rested on the hand of Noah, we find rest in the hands of Jesus. He invites us all to come. If you're hot, Jesus is your shade. I like this verse in Isaiah 32. A man shall be as a hiding place. That's Christ. He is our hiding place from the wind and a covered from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land, Jesus is our shade. If you're thirsty, Jesus is our water. He said to the woman at the well, if you come to me, I'll give you an artesian well that will spring up within you. If you're hungry, Jesus is our bread. He offers us the bread of life. He says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. That's the good news. The good news is that if you feel separated from God, Jesus is our bridge. He is our ladder. He said, you will see the Son of Man ascending and descending. I'm sorry, you will see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Christ is our bridge back to heaven. You know, the Bible says that if someone was guilty, there was a city of refuge and they could flee to the city and be safe. Jesus is our refuge. He is our city of refuge that we flee to from the wrath to come. Now, another important point in closing. The Bible tells us that while the gospel is good news and God has provided a way of escape, there is only one way. There is only one escape. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. You cannot do it through Buddha. You cannot do it through Krishna. You cannot do it through Muhammad. 
The only Savior is Jesus. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, how many? No one comes to the Father except through me. Not around me, not by me, not over me, not under me. You must go through me. He is the bridge. We go across His body to get to the Father. He must be your sacrifice. He is the only link. He is the only cure. I've heard it said before that during the dark ages, the bubonic plague spread through Europe. One out of three people died. They found it was from a flea that is carried by rats. And you know what the church had done is the church had said that cats were of the devil and there was a period of time in Europe where they were slaughtering all the cats. Well, what do you think happened to the rat population? It exploded and this plague began to spread from Europe and North Africa and Asia and even came at times to North America. Millions died. They did not know it then, but they know now that a cure for the bubonic plague is to get a blood transfusion of somebody who was exposed to the plague but did not succumb. Their blood becomes the antidote. You probably have heard of the great reformer Zwingli. He was one of the people who was exposed to the plague. They thought he was going to die, but he recovered. His blood would have been the antidote. Well, the only person who's lived in this world without sinning is Jesus. The only antidote for the disease of sin is the blood of Christ. Now, having said all this, the gospel is good news. And he died for your sin. He died for all of your sins. But you will not benefit from that sacrifice unless you receive it. You must consciously, willingly say, Lord, I want to accept your sacrifice in my behalf. I want to claim your blood that was spilt to wash away my sins. I want your forgiveness for the sins of the past. I want your power to live a new life in the present and in the future. And he promises that he'll do that for you. Do you believe him? Here's the good news. The gospel is Jesus gives you pardon. The Bible tells us that uh, he forgives us. Jesus gives us peace. He is the Prince of Peace and He offers us peace that passes understanding. The good news is that through Christ you have purpose. The good news is that Jesus gives us power. He says, all power is delivered unto me. Oh, it's understood what for? To give to us. Jesus gives us prestige. He says that you will be a nation of kings and priests. Those were the two highest offices that could be held in His time. To be a king or to be a priest. He says, that's what I'll make you. We have adoption through Him. He offers us paradise. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. That's good news. And the good news is he gives us all this in perpetuity. I wanted to keep them all when they started with the letter P. That means it's perpetual. It goes on forever and ever and ever. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what kind of life? Eternal life. The penalty for sin is death, but the gift of God, he'll give it to you as a gift if you receive the gift. The gift of God is everlasting life. And you don't have to do anything to receive that gift except come and believe it's true. We receive it by faith. Whoever believes in Him. Do you believe it, friends? This is what the Lord has done to save us. It's good news. He is the only way. If you've got a broken heart and you want it healed, if you want your eyes opened, if you're tired of being captive to the devil and you want liberty, that's the good news, is that Jesus will do all that for you. But you must choose to accept Him the only way to be saved. I want to, I'm going to make an appeal, give you an opportunity to respond. Please turn in your hymnals to 152. I love this song, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. It's the story of the gospel and why He came. Please stand, and I'd like to invite you to sing this with me. And as we sing... I want to make a special appeal. I expect there are some of you here today, there may be some of you young people who have never made a decision to accept Jesus and be baptized, and that's part of the, the accepting process. We would like to encourage you to make that decision today. It doesn't mean we'll baptize you today, but then we can prepare as you're ready. We want you to come. Some of you maybe have never accepted Jesus. Do that now. Accept the gospel. It's good news and you can have eternal life. Let's begin singing and I invite you to come. There'll be some pastors here to meet you.
Now, as we prepare to sing the next verse, I know some of you are feeling a struggle inside. There may be some of you who have raised, been raised in the church, and you might think, well, it must be obvious I'm a Christian. But things are not always as they appear. It's possible to have a Queen Mary park that never goes anywhere. You might need to make that decision. Maybe you have never in a tangible way said, I today am choosing to accept Jesus. And I'd like for those of you who have made that decision to be praying with me right now. Come, as we sing verse 2. Some of you in the balcony don't think, well, I'm too far away. I'll just do it in my heart. Jesus died publicly. He invites us to accept him publicly. There are only two masters. There are two roads. There are two forces at war. Love and selfishness, good and evil, light and darkness. And all of us must choose one or the other. To postpone a choice is really to make a choice. You're choosing to follow the losing team. Even if it's temporarily, it's a choice that you're making to serve the enemy. There may be some of you here who've made your decision, but you haven't been baptized yet. We'd like to have special prayer for you that God would help you to seal that and that he'd fill you with his spirit. And there may be others here who still are hesitating. You're feeling that battle in your heart. The devil's against you, God is for you, but you must choose, you must receive him. Come now as we sing the last verse and accept Jesus. Those who are making decisions, young people for baptism, come to the front. Amen. Praise the Lord for these decisions today. I'm very happy to see Stephen and Nathan up front today. And these decisions are registered in heaven. There may be some of you who are still struggling in your hearts. You would like to accept the gospel. And I pray you'll come and talk to the pastors. We'll help you make that decision. Maybe there's something that's frightening you or holding you back. I hope it's not sin because you come with your sins just as you are. God will give you victory over your sins. Is there anyone else? Before I close with prayer, you're feeling that struggle. Come now. Oh, well, praise the Lord. Come now. Don't be afraid. We're all in this together. How many sinned? All of us. We're all looking for the, the healing. Come as we pray. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's good news. Gospel is good news. The other thing I want you to remember before we pray those of you who have accepted Christ and you are Christians, God wants you to go and share the gospel now. I hope it's clear that this is good news. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, what would we do without the gospel? We were lost, but we can be found. We were in prison. Through Christ we're liberated. You have nourished our souls when we're hungry. You have moistened us when we are dry. Lord, we are so thankful for the purpose that you give us. We know where we have come from, what we are doing here, where we are going. You've given us hope, though our condition may appear hopeless, that we can be set free, that we can have everlasting life in paradise. Lord, we are so thankful for the good news. Help us to demonstrate that joy by accepting it by accepting Jesus, his sacrifice on our behalf, and by sharing the good news with a world that is perishing. This is why we exist as a church. This is our primary marching orders, to come to Christ and to go for Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this hope you've given us and this purpose and this joy. Bless those who've responded today. Protect them from the discouragement of the devil. I pray these decisions will be recorded in heaven and sealed by your Holy Spirit. 
We thank you for hearing this prayer because we pray in the name of your Son. Amen.